All right. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Event Leadership Institute's webinar uh, series. My name is uh, Mike Granick. I am the president and CEO here at, at the Event Leadership Institute. And uh, right next to me, you'll see uh, Brian Kruger, one of our instructors. Uh, thanks for joining us, Brian. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. So we are going to start a, a very fun uh, <laughs> webinar here all about tech, and I'm assuming that's why everybody's joined us. Uh, we're going to do a bit of a uh, webinar session. Brent's going to go through a few things, uh, and then what we'll do is we will open it up to questions. Now, if you look at your GoToWebinar control panel, uh, there is a little questions section. If it's not open for you, there's a little triangle on there. Go ahead and click that and open it up. That's where you can uh, ask your questions for Brant. So Brant will do a little presentation, then we'll open it up for Q&A at the end. Um, and before we uh, get started with Brant, I just want to introduce you to uh, the Event Leadership Institute briefly, tell you a little bit about who we are if you're not familiar with uh, who we are. Um, so the Event Leadership Institute uh, is uh, an online education company that, for the meetings and events industry. So we offer two main products and one of them is our on-demand video library, uh, which is uh, a subscription service so you can learn for $25 a month and see a whole bunch of different videos on a bunch of different topics and you have all access to all of that, um, as well as our professional development courses. So we've uh, got courses that run anywhere between four to ten weeks in length online and you can kind of learn on your own pace within that, you know, four to ten weeks. And we've, uh, you know, a couple of upcoming courses we have, for example, are event and meeting management fundamentals. Uh, that's ten weeks online. It's a certificate course and that's taught by Kevin White, um, CSCP. And you can get 36 uh, CMP hours for those of you that are interested in your CMP. And of course, without uh, big further ado, I suppose, uh, technical meeting with uh, the famous uh, Brent Kruger, and that's five weeks online, and that is also a certificate course, and you can get nine CMP hours for that as well. Um, so that is basically who the Event Leadership Institute is. Of course, if you have any questions, you can reach out to us at info at eventleadershipinstitute.com. And I think at this point what I'd like to do is, because you're not really here to talk to me, <laughs> you're here to learn all from Brant. So what I'm going to do is I'll pass the torch over to Brant. So uh, with a big roaring round of applause at your desk, please welcome Brant Kruger. Well, hey, everybody, and I'm happy happy to see that we are getting so many people joining us live. Obviously, I always, it's always nice to see uh, people come in live. Uh, I love doing live shows. It's just something about it that makes it much more interesting than the pre-recorded stuff uh, that we do. Um, what, when we sat down and kind of thought about what was this webinar going to be like, it's, it's so easy to get tucked into... Uh, model numbers and you know uh, all of you know various types of lights and things like that we wanted to keep this short we wanted to keep it easy we wanted to keep it high level and something that you guys could take back uh, you know right away to your events um, obviously encouraging folks if you want to learn a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of this stuff you know be sure and check out the class I mean that's that's what it's there for where we get into some of the details on that but for this one we wanted to keep it kind of high level you know what are five things that you know anybody can do to to you know really take their AV uh, a little bit more under their own control and and feel like they're starting to uh, go down a path where they understand it a little bit better and uh, feel like that they're you know not uh, having their eyes glaze over whenever they start to look at stuff so kind of tried to break that down you probably read my bio um, so just a real quick little bit about myself without going into the details. Again, top level points. Uh, I've been in the industry for over 20 years now at this point, and I was always that guy that was looking for how can we, you know, use technology to, to you know, spiff up our events, you know, make them better. I was the guy running into my boss's office saying, you know, hey, did you hear they can now, you know, you can now put five CDs into one CD player and you can play dinner jazz all night long. So always looking at technology, always very technology focused throughout my career. Um, and in the kind of the second half of my career though, my perspective kind of started to change because I started calling the show. So on our larger kind of internal uh, corporate meeting events, um, I was the guy in the back of the room. So, you know, on the headset, it really moved me from being kind of backstage to the back of the room. And it's a funny thing about the back of the room um, that uh, you actually kind of hear uh, how people really do feel about, about your events. So, you know, when you're back there, you know, the planners are off running around putting out a thousand fires, you know, the AV, you know, the 
lighting guy is done and you know he's playing Plants vs Zombies on his iPad. Um, but you know I kind of had to be paying attention to the room, paying attention to the show, and so you really got a vibe on. Uh, what people felt about events, and especially corporate meetings and events, um, they were pretty boring. They were pretty awful, and that's when I started to get involved uh, in education and you know speaking at conferences and things, trying to see what we could do to use technology and, and help people understand technology better in order to make their events better. So that's kind of how I got into this game. Um, the thing about technology is that it is it's always evolving. And it, it is constantly, you know, the model numbers are getting, are changing, the lumen counts on the projectors are getting larger, you know, it's always, it's always moving along. Now, as a tech person, I love that. Like, I think that's great, you know, I, so I, I follow it and I listen to podcasts, and, but I totally understand that there's a lot of people out there that's not the way they are. They're not going to always know what the latest thing is. They're not always going to know what the latest software is, the latest, you know, projection mapping thing that's come out. So technology is going to keep marching on. But the nice thing about AV, and this is why we really should learn more about AV, is that AV, the fundamentals stay the same. So even if you're dealing with these crazy proposals where you look at it and it's like an entirely new language and you don't understand all of these model numbers and cable types and things like that, if you learn the fundamentals of AV, you're really going to be able to at least engage in a conversation with your audiovisual provider where you feel like you have a little bit better knowledge, a little bit handle, better handle of what's going on. And so that's really where I've focused a lot of my energies is helping people learn kind of the fundamentals of audiovisual. And, you know, so Mike, if you can go ahead and just bring up that next bit. So a lot of people look at this, right, and they see this and their eyes glaze over and they, you know, just kind of skip past, you know, to the very end to see that really large number and say, you know, kind of cross your fingers and sign on the dotted line and go, God, I hope it's what I need. But so even if you're not one of those people that's following technology, you know, all, you know, all the time up on all the latest advancements, if you just take a moment to learn kind of the fundamentals, uh, it's really going to go a long way, not only helping you understand, uh, you know, what might be or might not be on your on your vids, but it's going to help you save money because, um, and this is something that we've talked about uh, a lot in a lot of, uh, you know, some of our other webinar sessions is, you know, people are always afraid that they're getting taken. They're always afraid that they're, you know, getting overbid, that someone's trying to take advantage of them. And, you know, yes, there's going to be unscrupulous people in any profession, but the vast majority of AV providers aren't out there trying to take you. Um, you know, they're, they just want to make sure that they're covered. And the more that you're having an educated conversation, the more likely they are to go, okay, this person knows what they're talking about, so we're going to give them exactly what they want and not try and add a little bit more to cover ourselves to make sure that we're totally covered. And we can uh, certainly talk more about any details that you want to ask about that uh, when we get into the questions session. So to kind of come full circle, what we tried to do today was to not get into the model numbers, not get into the weeds as far as different types of lights and things like that, but to really go into kind of the fundamentals, the essentials of what you can do to just start to take those first steps of taking control uh, of your audiovisual experience. And I kind of broke it down, like I said, into five of these various essentials. So let's start with the first one, which is I just really want you to start thinking earlier about audiovisual. Um, uh, this is something that if you ask anybody who's in audiovisual or production, they will usually have that be their number one ask uh, from planners uh, or venues or whoever's bringing them in is really thinking about audiovisual earlier in early in the process because a lot of times what happens and and I'm sure you guys will relate to this is you know okay we had a great event last year we need to top it this year so we all sit down in a room. And we come up with the theme. And the theme is going to be, you know, the thing that it's going to be next year. And uh, the theme kind of reigns supreme then in everything else from that point on. Is, so everything's backing up the theme of the event. Um, but the problem is that usually we're not bringing in our audiovisual provider at that point. So by the time you bring in your AV or production company, you've already decided what the theme is. And you've already kind of box them in to a certain extent of now whatever it is that you're going to do, it has to be within this theme. Now, it may have been 
that there were a couple different themes being bounced around and you know trying to decide which one you want to go with for that year and you having an AV person in the room during that process might help guide those decisions maybe you're kind of on the fence between you know rocket now and here's to 2018 you know whatever the themes are going to be you know but having someone who has the knowledge of oh you know what we could do with theme A versus theme B is, you know, they're already starting to think about what equipment would be used to bring that theme to life. And you might be able to uh, help guide uh, the entire process, guide the theme at the very beginning and have a better understanding of what technology you're going to need from the very beginning as opposed to trying to later impose it upon someone. So unfortunately, a lot of times what happens is we come up with this incredible theme but then however we're going to try and implement it is going to be really expensive or it's going to be impossible to do. So having an AV person just in the room uh, earlier on in the process is going to tremendously help shape what your eventual AV bit is going to be. Um, there's more to that that I'm going to come back to later in kind of my third step. But uh, just in general, thinking about audiovisual in uh, as soon as possible, uh, you know, what type of equipment is going to let you bring that event to life uh, as early on in the as, as, as possible in the process. Now, the next one uh, is kind of stems out of that because when you involve your, your audiovisual people or your production people earlier on in the process, they can help you with negotiations. So uh, I used to work for a, a meeting and event production company here in Minneapolis for uh, about 18 years. And during that time, we would have gladly, and, and we would beg our clients, in fact, let us come in so early in the process that you haven't even picked the venue yet. Even if you don't know for sure that you're going to use us, uh, you know, so even if you haven't started that part of the process where you're putting out the RFP for your uh, audiovisual company or your production company, let us still come in and let us look at that contract before you sign it. Um, there's, you, we're more used to the pitfalls, and there's, there's a greater awareness now of a lot of the pitfalls than there used to be a few years ago. But being aware of those contract negotiation uh, pitfalls as far as Am I going to get dinged bringing in a third-party AV company? Uh, is it going to be, uh, am I going to be required to use the in-house rigging um, in a company? You know, are they going to be requiring me, am I going on their insurance or are you going on my insurance? That's always a point of contention. So don't be afraid to bring in an AV or production person. Um, and, and like I said, we would have done it even if we hadn't got the bid yet. Uh, to, to take a look at your contracts before you sign them and make sure that you're not falling into one of those traps. Now, another part of that is if you have already engaged a third-party AV company, so not the in-house AV company, you can use that as leverage. So as, you know, as they're getting providing their bid for the in-house, uh, you always should get that third-party uh, AV bid so that you've got something to go back to them and say, um, you know, sorry, we can get this now for half as much. There's a story that I like to tell uh, of a time where we wanted to use the in-house AV company. They'd actually, they were a good crew. We'd used them the year before, um, and it was a very simple show, so there wasn't any need to bring in, you know, a, a great big third-party company. Just a couple projectors and a small sound system, but for whatever reason, that year they decided to charge us $12,000 for it. And we went to them going, this is ridiculous, guys. Come on, we want to use you guys. Uh, we understand that the in-house is always a little bit more expensive, uh, you know, you know, so what's you know what's going on? Well, that's that's just what the bid is. Okay, so we found a third-party AV company that was able to do it for three thousand dollars, and that included the ding that we had to pay to the hotel for using a third-party company. So always, always, always get that third-party bid because you never know; it might absolutely be worth your while. I mean, so almost a ten thousand dollar difference. Uh, even still, we did go back to the other AV company and just say, "Come on." 12,000, 3,000, you know, can you meet us in the middle even? And for whatever reason on that particular event, they just couldn't do it. Um, but always, always, always get that third party uh, bid so that you've got some leverage, you've got some negotiation. Um, the next kind of session that section is, is, and this is what I was alluding to earlier about getting started earlier, is getting organized. Um, so often, uh, and, and, and I mean this, this is, this is just, I just hear it a lot. I don't mean it as a dig, but so often planners will use the, well, things are going to change. 
uh, kind of as an excuse to put off dealing with the AV things. Um, it's, kind of, it's a natural thing, you've got other things to do, um, but this goes back again to bringing the AV companies earlier in the process. So more often than not, you know more than you think you know. So it's easy to say, oh, I can't commit to this because uh, things are always going to change, they're going to change at the last minute. But most of the time, on most of our events, especially in corporate and association events, we know a lot more uh, then perhaps we're, we're letting on even to ourselves. You know, you have a general outline in your head of, well, okay, we usually have a keynote speaker to begin with, and then you know the association president comes out and welcomes folks, and then you know we've got a panel, and then, so you can already start again very early in the process to figure out roughly what your AV needs are going to be. Now there may be some big picture stuff that's going to change, yes. Uh, there may be some shifts in microphones from here to there, yes. But again, a lot more often than I think people give themselves credit for, we know these things in advance. And we know what types of presentations they're going to be. So the reason that I keep going back to that is that then can help guide you as you write your RFP. So when you're going out and getting those bids, the more of that information that you're able to sketch out, once again, the more that the AV company is going to feel like you know what you talk, you're talking about. So they're going to be less likely to overbid on your event and put in equipment that you might not need. If you've got a really good handle on how many speakers you have, how many panels you have, and um, uh, maybe even overbid yourself a little bit, you know, just to say, you know, well, we're only going to have five, but maybe we should order six uh, wireless lobs just in case. Um, and you're having those conversations with your AV provider, once again, they're going to be less likely to try and, you know, add a little extra gear just to make sure that you're covered if, you're, if they know that you're already doing that. So getting organized as early as possible and knowing you know, just roughly how many microphones you're going to need, roughly whether or not you're planning on having, you know, PowerPoint and iMag at the same time, or are the two screens always going to be showing the same thing no matter what's on them. Uh, just thinking through the very basics, the fundamentals of what you're going to need for your AV. Are you going to be playing back video, or is it just going to be PowerPoint? Uh, you know, all of these little things, most people know earlier on in the process um, than they sometimes again, give themselves credit for. So getting all of that information together, bringing it into your audiovisual person earlier, all of those things are going to help you get more accurate quotes. They're going to help you not have those last minute oopses uh, when you, you know, when you get on site and, oh, by the way, yeah, well, we do need to play back video or something along those lines. So the more of that that you can do in advance, the less of those last minute charges you're going to have and the more accurate you're going to get in your bids. Number four is ask questions. So if there's an underlying theme to all of these things is that I want to try, I want you guys to try and have a dialogue with your audiovisual providers. So it's an ongoing dialogue. You're bringing them in early, you're giving them whatever information you have as you, as you get it, as you start to lay down what the schedule is, you're giving them that information. It's an ongoing thing. But when you do get that bid and you are looking at all of those things and numbers, you should feel comfortable asking what they are. Don't ever feel stupid. Don't ever feel like, oh, they're just going to laugh at me and, you know. You're the one that's paying. You're the one that's putting your money where your mouth is, right? You're putting, you're signing your, signing your name on the dotted line on that thing. You should have the right to ask what every single one of those line items are. And feel free to do that, I say, because that's how you are going to find out if someone is being unscrupulous. If someone is, you know, and I've, I, I, I tell this story often, and Mike probably heard it a thousand times, but um, uh, I was working an event, and it was our first year with with the company, and they had had a previous you know provider for several years before that, and um, I was doing kind of the voice of God stuff. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, and. During the lunch break, the client came up to me and she said, so was that you doing the voice of God? And I said, yeah, that's, that was me. Now, are you, is that running through some kind of box? I said, well, no, it's just a microphone and it goes into the soundboard and, and that's, that's it. Maybe some equalization on it, but it's, you know, no, it's just me into a soundboard. So there's no voice of God box. And, you know, we're all kind of looking at her funny at that point. No, there's, there's no voice of God box. It's just, just me and a microphone. She's like, I knew it. 
And so for several years prior to that, on their AV bid, there had been a line item for Voice of God box. Now, I can think of a lot of things that that could be, but I don't know for sure. And she didn't know for sure, and she was embarrassed to ask about it. And she was $200 a day for this thing. So, you know, it could have been some piece of equipment, you know, that they used, uh, like an equalizer or something like that, and that's what they called it around the shop. Or it could have been nothing. But either way, she should have been comfortable asking them, hey, what is this Voice of God box, and what does it do? And if you know kind of the fundamentals of how AV work, their answer is either going to make sense or it's not going to make sense. So, you know, just kind of knowing the underlying basics of, of, of video and audio and switching and things like that, uh, whatever answer they give, uh, it's either going to ring true or it's going to red flag. And then at that point, you can maybe show it to somebody else and, and say, hey, you know, what's, uh, this is what they're telling me. Does that jive with you? And and feel free, by the way, anytime, uh, I'll have my contact information at the end. If, any, if anything comes up like that and you're at all unsure about it, feel free to contact me anytime. I always say part of the price of admission on webinars or the classes or anything like that is you get to ask me questions in perpetuity afterwards. So feel free to do that. Um, so just, just know it's always okay to ask questions and it's always okay to to you know, get a second opinion. And that's another reason why you should get those third party quotes is even if you love the in-house AV and you love, you know, you know you want to use them, you know, just getting that third party quote can help you compare things uh, and say, well, okay, now why is this you know, so much different? You know, why are you giving me a 10K projector and the third party's coming in with a 3K? You know, tell me why. You know, even if you don't know what those numbers mean, it should be a bit of a red flag when you see something that's out of whack you know so if you're able to get a couple different bids even and you see one of them is like this and the other two are like this that's when you're able to start asking those questions and go so why exactly are you doing it that way and they'll either have an answer that makes sense or they won't so the fifth thing that's kind of essential that I'd like you to take away is spend wisely and now that should seem pretty obvious okay what you know so what do you mean spend wisely well of course I want to spend wisely that's why I'm taking this webinar uh, is, to, is to learn a little bit more about you know how to spend and the reason that I bring this up is I'm always asked this question and and so I kind of wanted to add it as as the fifth one to uh, preempt getting asked the question during the questions uh, se section uh, which is what is my best spend when it comes to audiovisual? So when it comes to AV, you know, if I have to make choices in budget and things like that, what does that look like and where's my best spend? And for me personally, um, I always say the best spend and the most important spend is audio. Um, you know, think about this webinar today. Um, uh, you know, if, if you can't understand my voice, if you can't hear my voice or you're straining to hear me, this whole thing, you know, is a loss for you. So even though I've got, you know, a, a few slides and you can see, hopefully see my smiling face on webcam, um, uh, the most important thing is audio as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there's been scientific studies that show that if people are straining to hear someone in a conversation, it produces an actual like stress response um, in the body where like it's, it's a stressful thing to have to be straining to hear someone. So when we have, you know, these giant conventions where we've got 3,000 people, uh, if you've got half the audience that's straining and stressing, you know, trying to hear uh, the keynote speaker, it's no wonder that, you know, by the time three o'clock rolls around, we're just exhausted because we've actually been physically stressed at that point for hours on end. So for me personally, if you're having to decide between you know, what your best spend audiovisual is going to be, I always go with audio. Make sure that you've got good quality audio. Make sure you're, you're more than covered as far as the amount of sound. If it's a big room, you know, if it's a deep room, you might need delay speakers so that everybody's getting, uh, you know, kind of equal access to the audio. Same thing with a wide room. If it's a very wide room, you might need some speakers out on the edges uh, just to help fill in that sound. And then speaking of filling in sound, if you've got a very wide stage, you're gonna wanna make sure that you're filling the middle area that of the people. So a lot of times that's when you'll find, uh, you know, some people complaining that something is too loud and other people complaining that they can't hear at all is that's because they're winding up in that dead zone kind of in the middle when you've got the two speaker stacks out on the edges of the stage, then all the people in the middle aren't getting access to that sound. So, um, so I always emphasize sound from there, then I usually take it to uh, video 
and then from there I would go into lighting. Like you can always kind of get away with a basic lighting package, but man, when you can't afford it, lighting is probably the biggest impact that you can make. So when you do have the money, you know, that's where you can definitely make your biggest impact and changes as far as mood goes is with lighting. So even though I kind of put it as priority three, when you've got the budget and you've got the money, that's where you can make your biggest impact is probably with lighting. Um, but if your message can't get across because your video is terrible and your projectors are too dark and things like that, um, that's why I kind of put that as far as three as, as opposed to uh, video and level two. So those are kind of, you know, obviously we want to keep this, we wanted to keep this thing without going too terribly deep into any one you know, subject. We wanted to keep this kind of high level uh, as far as things. So those are the top five things all centering around um, centering around communication, centering around making it a conversation uh, with you and your AV provider, making sure that you're giving them the information in a timely manner as early as possible. No one will ever complain about getting some information early, even understanding that it might change. Um, they'll always be happier uh, to get something earlier rather than later. Um, so you know, you know more than you think you know. You know, Get that information to them as quickly as possible as far as number of microphones, what kind of media you expect to have. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, it's the, probably one of the bigger things is just being able to have that conversation, ask questions, and if something stinks, have somebody else take a look at it to make sure uh, that there isn't a, a possibility that you're getting taken or something and you've never heard of a Voice of God box and no one has uh, either. So, and, and then finally, you know, take a look at how you're spending your money. Make sure that that message, that communication, you know, is probably the most important thing in almost all of our events is getting some kind of message across, uh, whether it's internal or association or even awards or things like that. There's usually a message that you're trying to get across. Um, so make sure you start with audio and then work your way out from there. As far as I'm concerned, that's the best spend of money. So with that, uh, we've got a few minutes available for Q&A. Oh, I forgot to unmute myself. There you go. <laughs> Key thing, audio, what do you know? Yeah. Uh, well, Brent, thank you so much. A lot of great information uh, on uh, in your presentation there. What I'd like to do right now is open it up to all of you guys uh, with some questions. So now you have access to Brent. You've got access to an expert. Now's the time. If you look on your GoToWebinar control panel, there's a little section that says questions there. If it's not open, push the little triangle that is on the left side of that and open it up. You can answer, ask your questions right in uh, that uh, that space as well. Um, so I think, uh, I don't see any questions quite yet, but uh, you know, please feel free. Oh, hang on, there we go, we got one coming in, perfect. Um, so should uh, sound be brought uh, outside the venue if people are outside the main room? It depends on the event. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's, I, I always like it. So, I mean, especially when you've got, say, a main ballroom and people are going to be milling around out in the lobby, I think it's always a good idea to have a couple of extra speakers out in the lobby. Um, so, you know, you've got the walk in music playing out there, uh, they're able to hear the announcements. Uh, of, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to begin in five minutes, that kind of thing. Uh, because that happens all too often where, uh, you know, you're making those announcements in the room, but not everybody's in the room. So they're not hearing the 15 minutes, the 10 minutes, the five minutes, the please take your seats because they're out still in the cocktail area, you know, pushing one down. So it's, um, I, I think it's great. You know, I think it's a great idea and it's something that, that uh, probably gets underused. Yeah, is using, uh, you know, some kind of remote speaker system out in, in the lobby or again, you know, if you're, if you're actually you know, physically moving, having to have some people be in a remote location, uh, sure, and obviously, definitely, they need to be able to hear it. Perfect, and that, that question for, was uh, from Andrew. Andrew, thanks for your question. Uh, we've got a question from uh, Olga. So uh, can you please recommend resources, podcasts, blogs, etc., cetera, uh, to keep up with uh, AV-related updates that uh, perhaps are not too technical? Well, see, that's the tough one. I mean, there's, there's some great um, uh, industry publications and things like that, but they do tend to be for someone that uh, is, is wanting to get into AV. Um, there's, a, there's a podcast called The AV Life um, that, that does stray into things like marketing um, and, uh, you know, other... Uh, you know, other AV tangential <laughs> things, um, and 
so so that's a good one. Uh, Event Icons is a show that I do, uh, a weekly show that I'm occasional co-host for. Um, it's hashtag Event Icons. You can uh, find out more. I think that's event-icons.com. Uh, BizBash has a... Uh, a podcast called Gather Geeks that occasionally dips into AV, but otherwise is is you know much like the BizBash publication itself. I suppose there's probably a uh, 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 what's a disclosure, full disclosure that, that there is a relationship between BizBash and Event Leadership Institute. Um, uh, so, but the Gather Geeks podcast, that's good. Uh, as far as blogs go, I like uh, Event MB is is good. BizBash also obviously has a good blog. Um, uh, so, um, Event MB is uh, a good manager good blog. course that uh, you could take. Yeah, there's there, there's a technical meeting and production course that's coming up. Um, it's a small plug. Uh, but I'll be honest with you, just to, and I'm not trying to plug the course, but one of the reasons that I started the course, to be perfectly honest with you, is that there weren't a lot of things that were aimed at kind of the casual AV learner. Um, you know, that course is 100% designed and aimed at planners. It's not designed for people that are wanting to get into the AV industry. Um, it is it is designed to be targeted toward planners who want to learn more about uh, audiovisual to make their events better. There you go. And uh, just on a side note too, for those that are interested, uh, one of the things we were sort of tossing the idea around was uh, doing a regular series on uh, tech production, whether it's uh, Facebook Live or, or webinars. So please stick around uh, uh, with the Event Leadership Institute. Sign up for our e-newsletter as well, and uh, stay tuned. Check out us. On, uh, check us out on Facebook because we might do more of those. Okay, we got a bunch more questions coming in. This okay. is great. Thank you so much for your engagement, guys. I really uh, appreciate that. Um, so we've got a question here from uh, Holly. Uh, why does an AV company charge seven fifty per day for a small lumen projector in a breakout room for one hundred and fifty people? The projectors use it's not new. One of my biggest pet peeves is the amount hotel AV companies charge for projectors. That's a great question. It's, it's, it's in house versus versus third party. I mean, um, and, and just to round it out, I just wanted to say how much I, I we we did a, a an ask me anything on Facebook Live, and I absolutely loved it. So I do hope I hope that we can try and make it a semi regular thing. And I love this part of it is just doing doing questions. So the biggest thing is the the in house AV. I always say they they do get a bad rep. Everybody knows they're more expensive. There's a time and a place for in house AV. You know, it's it's the same as the candy bar. In the hotel, you know, lobby, uh, you know, store, right? So that it's nine dollar candy bar if you go and get it at the lobby store, and you can get the same candy bar, you know, down at the Seven Eleven, the three blocks away, for you know a dollar or two dollars. Well, yeah, if you want to go walk and get that, you know, and go and get that candy bar, then you can, and you can get the same one for two dollars. So it really is the same thing for AV. It's a convenience factor. So the reason they charge so much is because they can and because there are people that are willing to pay for it uh, at that price so that they don't have to deal with it. They don't have to go out and get a third-party bid. They can just, at the end of it, it's on their master bill. They can sign it, and it can be done. So it's people, you know, so it's it really is the same thing. It's convenience. You're paying for it because it's there, and you don't have to go and get third-party AV bids. But Again, that's why I always recommend getting third-party AV bids, even if you are that person who doesn't want to have, you know, wants it to be on the master bill and doesn't, you know, want to have to deal with it, and you want that safety, of, you know, comfort blanket of like knowing that they're there in the hotel if if they need if you need anything, um, you know, still get that third-party bid and use it for leverage so that you can get that. So you can say, look, come on, guys. You're charging this much for what I know is a used projector and hasn't been, you know, updated in a while. I can get the same projector or better, you know, for a quarter of the price. Use it as leverage, and they'll either come down or they won't. And if they don't, then use the third-party AV company. It's it's kind of how I, you know, how I look at it. Is there's a time and a place, but you're paying for that convenience. I, I remember too when I was producing events, I had clients always uh, ask me, you know, why. Um, uh, you, know, you know the projector is 750, uh, but I can go down to Staples and I'll buy a projector for a thousand yeah. or fifteen hundred dollars. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is that those projectors that you can buy for almost the same price are absolutely not the same thing. I mean, your AV company is buying a projector that's 
10, 20, 30, 40 thousand dollars, the bright it's much brighter. Uh, you're gonna have a crisper image. So the, it's just um, you can you can actually have all the lights in your ballroom on or your meeting room on and not have the screen washed out. Whereas the ones from Staples, the the lumens, which is the brightness, is gonna be a lot less. So I think that kind of comparison as well. Just be careful when you're comparing those things, especially in front of your clients, um, because they're not exactly the same product. And that's that's one of the challenges. And just to, to let you know too, the the cost of changing those bulbs in the projector too um, they are you know what five hundred dollars a thousand dollars a bulb uh, alone but be, that yeah. being said uh, Brant's right I mean if you if they're <laughs> selling you an old dim you know dirty looking old projector that's a totally different story <laughs> so, right uh, yeah, good question I mean, okay Oh, sorry, especially for break, I was just going to say, especially for breakouts, I think you know some of those off-the-shelf projectors would probably do fine. And there is a cost-benefit analysis there, but then you have to think about shipping. You have to think about, you know, am I really going to, you know, keep these in the boxes and keep them in a, you know, in a closet somewhere? So there's a convenience factor there too, and they know that. Damage. Why they charge what they can? Yeah, and what happens if that gets damaged? So. Um, and again, I've been in a position where we bid out an event and we looked at it and we went out and bought 45 projectors, you know, from Best Buy because it was just going to make more sense for, you know, compared to what they wanted. And we just accepted the fact that we were going to use them basically this once and any more that we got out of it, great. But, you know, even for, you know, for that one event, it priced out, you know, well under just to go buy them. So sometimes it happens. But you have to so be willing to do Brent it. Brent has a lot of great movie nights at his house, just so you know. Um, all right, we've got a question here from Taryn. Uh, do you know of a, a good resource to reference uh, for those AV terms that you showed us uh, on one of the of your earlier slides? You know, the ones uh, are eyes glaze over in confusion. <laughs> there's, a, there's a few. I do actually have a glossary on my website at, at brantkruger.com. Um, I, I don't know the direct path to it, but I think it's just brantkruger.com slash glossary. Um, and we can try and put that out uh, yes, if we have one of the channels. Um, and that covers a lot of the, that stuff uh, that, that, you know, is kind of the general stuff. When you start getting into model numbers and things like that, it's, it's tough. I'm not going to lie. So I always, um, when I see someone's just putting a model number on there, I instantly Google it. You know, if it doesn't say you know, whether it's a 5K projector or a 3K projector, uh, usually if you just Google the model number, uh, you'll get pretty close to it pretty right away because they're selling it on, you know, B&H Video or something along those lines, and it'll have all the specs listed. So I have to do that sometimes. You know, I, I, I can't memorize every single model number and every single lamp type and every single, you know. So I know I'm frequently having to do that as well, even on the bids. And that's honestly one of the things that kind of drives me nuts sometimes about AV companies is what they bother to put, that what they put on their, their bids is their warehouse pick list. You know, because the software is going to track through and, you know, and in the end, you know, they want to bring 14 Edison plugs at 15 feet and, you know, a thousand foot of, you know, Cat5 cable. And you don't care about that. I don't care about that. You know, bring whatever cables you need to make it go. And, and you know, just tell me how many lights I'm going to get. Tell me, you know, how, you know, how big are the projectors that I'm going to have, how big are the screens. I don't need to know that you're bringing 37 safety cables, you know. So I really wish AV companies wouldn't do that on their bids. I wish they would kind of break it down into, and they're getting better. They're getting better of like lighting, here's what you're going to get. You know, video, here's what you're going to get. Audio, here's what you're going to get. And then just, it should just be understood that whatever cable it's going to take to make that go, you're going to bring and make, make it go. Um, and then if you want that level of detail, then, you know, they can provide it. But, yeah, I wish they wouldn't have all that stuff on there. You know, it's – or, or at the very least, you also have to have the descriptor. So it's not an, you know, 87.5 leprechaun. You know, it's uh, – it's, 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 it has to say that it's a lighting console, you know, and just yeah. – and, and put it on that one. Now, you know, I think one of the, the key points that you had earlier, Brent, was ask. Just ask. Ask. Yeah. I mean, the best way to learn anything is as ask. And you're, you know, if you haven't learned the language yet, you're going to ask what, how to get to the bathroom. How do I say that? You know, yeah. instead of standing there worried, you know. So ask the question um, and don't be embarrassed to ask. I think one of the things that I see with a lot of planners is that they're really afraid to ask the question at fear of looking stupid. But at the end of the day, you're not going to look stupid if you learn. And if you're working with an audiovisual provider that makes you feel stupid. 
uh, for asking the question, then you might want to consider a different AV provider because they should be all yeah. on your team and they should be excited that you want to learn their craft and what you're doing. And maybe not their craft in terms of like how to do it, but learn the language of the craft. So, all right, we got another question here from uh, Macy. Uh, any thoughts on what the, uh, the next big AV trends are for corporate events? Yeah, and and I'm so the this is the second half of my year here. I have more of those. So my first half of the year, I wasn't on a lot of those kind of big productions. They seem to be all loaded into the second half of my year this year. So I'm still kind of seeing some of that stuff for the first time here at the end of the year. But what I've seen so far um, has been playing with uh, playing with display. So, um, and this is something that I've been a fan of for a while. I love display technology and projection technology, so I'm always a fan of, of experimenting with that. Um, one of the last uh, big shows that I was on had, you know, kind of the standard IMEG, or standard, you know, horizontal 16 by 9 screens, and then next to them had two vertical screens that were exclusively used, almost exclusively used for IMEG. So having that vertical screen uh, in addition, so you never had to make that decision of switching between presentation or iMag. You could actually keep the presentation up on the side screens, then have the iMag on the vertical screens, and then in addition to that, they had a giant, you know, backdrop screen as well. So, you know, using using projection as a canvas that you can kind of paint on as part of your stage sets, I always like. Um, so I'm a big fan of display technology. And then kind of on the less expensive side, but yet also kind of a trend this year has been interaction. Everybody's been all about the interaction interactive this year uh, regarding, you know, whether it's polling or, you know, pushing that into the app somehow, asking people questions, getting feedback, you know, really getting in more involved with the interactive side, um, actually had, you know, for people who know the uh, the catch box, the little, you know, throwing thing, uh, throwable microphone that, that a lot of people have been using on their events, um, actually had a, 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 a CEO, I think it was a CFO or something like that, say, don't we have those? Why don't we have those? You know, I mean, literally, they go to the Q&A session and they had the standard, you know, microphones in the aisles uh, in the audience. And the CFO was like, basically, you know, what are we, barbarians? Why don't we have the throwable microphones? You know, so <laughs> interactive has been a big part of it this year and, um, uh, and then display technology. So I, I'm a big fan of display technology, as you could tell. All right, we have a question from Nadine here. Uh, if we're utilizing music in between sessions or speakers, what are the main licensing companies we need to contact? Oh, it's three of them. I'm blanking off the top. It's BMI. Um, uh, or, oh, man. I'm blanking off the top of my head. That's what Google's for. Uh, <laughs> so, But it is very important that you talk to all three because each one has a limited set. Of, of you know their artists and music that you use so um, unless you're willing to lock yourself into one or the other's music catalog you do need to look at all three um, and make sure that you get a license for all three and they they all have uh, fairly uh, general licenses for uh, for events um, the thing that I've noticed is that they really push um, they push it back onto the person that's holding the event, so the company or person that's holding the event. So at one point, you know, uh, I was doing some research to see if it made sense for the production company I was working for to get that license, and they, they really didn't want to give us a license for it because they wanted to track back to the individual responsible for the uh, for the event, so whatever company is putting it on, whatever association is putting on. Um, so if you're in that position where you're an internal meeting planner, or um, uh, or you know someone who works for an association, then yeah, you should definitely be looking into that because that seemed to be the way that the licensing companies wanted to work. They were not very open to blanket licenses as a production company. Um, and I, my understanding is they're also not, and, and I could be wrong on this, it's been a while since I looked into it, um, they were also not at the time very open to having open licenses for a venue. So the venue may tell you, oh no, we got this covered, um, but when you actually start digging into it, um, they're usually covered for like their hallways or, you know, those kinds of things where they've got Muzak 
pumping, you know, in the casino or something, but it's their spaces, and usually there's a carve out in that license that says, you know, if you're basically if you're bringing it in for a private event or something along those lines, then they're not covered. So again, it's been a while since I looked into it, but it's definitely something if you're an association or uh, an internal meeting planner, it's it's worth looking into, and it wasn't terribly expensive so um, yeah. it's better better safe than sorry unfortunately on a lot of that stuff and you can't just play Spotify that, yeah. that, that's not, that doesn't work. It doesn't count. Well there's also a difference between uh, what's called music synchronization versus uh, just playing music in an event so if you're actually taking and editing music or you're adding it to a video that's called mm -hmm. synchronization and that's a totally different licensing yeah. game where, uh, versus just playing music from the original track not even copying it because there's also duplication licenses so yeah. if you want to copy them and duplicate it gets very very it's messy quickly uh, right? most yeah. of the licenses that you would get as a corporate as a corporate entity or as an association would be just that being able to play it for like walk-in music or something but the second you edit it or change it or something along those lines you are not technically licensed for that music exactly it's a good when, question. When I, yeah, it's a great question. One of the things when I used to produce events, one of the, it, I just found it easier to use realtor for your music. You know, uh, yeah. maybe it's not the most uh, popular Katy right. Perry song. You know, <laughs> but you can find some pretty good stuff there that's good enough for what you're wanting to do, or that's exciting enough for for the corporate side of you know, uh, the videos that you're doing and things like that. But it's just nice and easy that way. All right, we got another question here from Heather. Um, yeah. Now, what steps would you take to ensure that a stage party, approximately 70 on risers, I'm assuming 70 people on risers, can okay. hear the audio for a formal uh, ceremony? So the people are on stage, I'm assuming by reading that or by hearing that. Um, it's, it's what's called a... a, a the full back monitor so that you put the monitor basically down on the stage and that they're going to be sending that audio back onto the stage it's actually a good idea anytime you're going to have a Q&A or a panel or something along those lines where you're going to be taking questions from the audience is you need to make sure that you've got speakers facing the stage um, uh, that are going to uh, get that information now you have to have a decent audio person that knows how to route audio properly because what you don't want is them hearing themselves unless they're in a rock band or you know a singer of some kind they don't want to be he hearing themselves as just keynote speakers or something along those lines so you're going to need to route the audio to make sure that that's not getting broadcast back uh, and then having a chance of feedback or something along those lines so um, you just need basically the short answer is you need speakers facing backwards uh, onto the stage in order to be able to, I, I hope I answer your question on there. If not, just please feel free to follow up. And, but and thank you and everybody. That's audio still, tech. Yeah, thank you everybody that's still sticking around. I mean, I, I love this kind of thing. I love just bouncing questions off. So it looks like there's still quite a few people hanging around. So as long as yeah, you guys are getting benefited out of it, I'm happy to stick around. We have a few more questions here too, so yeah. we'll we'll keep going for a few more questions, and then uh, we'll see where we end up here. Uh, sure. So we've got a good question here from uh, uh, Lucila. Um, is it preferable to provide a budget when reaching out for bids, or get an initial bid based on needs and then negotiate from there? That's a great question. Yeah, and there's no right answer to it because I mean I'm a firm believer in, and and again another reason why I kind of got into the education side in, in transparency. And it's very difficult for AV providers and production companies to get, you know, even just a, even if you give them a ballpark, you know, it just helps frame your mind of where you need to be, you know, when you when you're putting your quotes together, you know. And I think people worry that, well, if I tell them it's twenty thousand, you know, then they're going to build up to that point, and you know, even if I only need ten thousand worth a year. And I, I think, you know, I think a lot of it again comes down to this communication, conversation, letting it be a back and forth. Um, so sometimes I put rough budgets in my RFPs, sometimes I don't. Um, you know, sometimes I'll put in something a little lower and then have a reserve in mind. So, you know, if, if you know, knowing that, you know, okay, I'll put it in at 30, but I've really got 35, you know, just to, you know, have a little bit of reserve just for things that do pop up at the last minute or something along those lines. So I don't think there's a right answer, but I think it's it's very helpful in both scenarios because a lot a lot of other times I like to when you know when I'm talking to one of my clients, I would rather get know what their sun and moon and stars vision is uh, without talking budget 
before we start backing into but at some point you do have to back into a budget and then you can say okay I know what the things were that were the most important to you in your vision where we didn't talk budget so we can now prioritize those when we do talk budget so I think it's definitely valuable to have the conversation at the 10,000 foot level of the Sun and the moon and the stars if you had unlimited budget how would you do this but then obviously at some point you need to start throttling back yeah, and I, I think giving your, and this is my thoughts, uh, you know, giving giving your AV supplier some sort of range to work with because, um, you know, I've I heard a great comment, I can't remember which webinar this or which session I attended, but somebody said, well, when a client came to me and said, oh, I, you tell me what the budget is, um, they turned around and said to the client, oh, so like $10 million, that's, uh, that's about right, isn't it? And uh, no, 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 I was thinking more like $10,000. So, right. you know, to give them a little bit of a range, then they know what they're working with. But, uh, you know, to take it a step back, really having a good relationship with your AV supplier and trusting them and knowing that these people that you're hiring are not going to screw you over, that's really imperative. And if they're part of your team, if they, if you feel that they can really contribute to your team, I think that's that's the best way to go. They say, hey, look, I've got this great event. I've got twenty thousand to spend. What can you get me for that? And I, I, that's that's the way I used to work, anyways. All right, yeah, we've got yeah. a question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just to say, there's there's time for both. There's times when you need when you know what that number is, and you need to say, hey, we need to get in get under this number, or we can't do it. And then there's other times where there's there's a little more flexibility. Ten million dollars. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, we got a question from Melody. Now, before I uh, go into this question, Melody, there are no silly questions, Melody. No silly questions. So take that out of your vocabulary. No. They're just questions. Ask the question. Never feel stupid about asking a question, um, even if it's you know where does the power come from? <laughs> yeah. She says, "LOL." You say that now. <laughs> okay, I'll read the rest of her question. Oh, okay, oh, and this is silly. Uh, no. <laughs> okay, why is there such a high markup for AV, uh, such as uh, PSAV starting bid at twenty five k, and then offer a discount like fifteen k? Uh, well. <laughs> Yeah, tangential to that. So part part so part of that is uh, their agreements with the venues. Um, they have large amounts, uh, like significant percentages that they need to pay back to the venue. That is part of that contract. And so the 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 other side of that coin is why is it when I go to you know a PSAV at this venue uh, and it's here, and then I get the exact same bid from a PSAV at this venue and it's here. Uh, it's because those contracts are actually negotiated on a venue by venue basis. It's not a, it's not usually a national contract. So um, it'll be you know the amount that they have to kick back to the venue will change dramatically depending on where they are. Um, now that's when you know working with people at the negotiation stage comes into play that you know because that money is getting kicked back to the hotel if the hotel wants your business and knows that you're willing to walk if you know you don't get what you want um, you know they can then put the pressure on the in-house AV company and say you know what don't worry about it we'll eat the you know the service fee on that one because we really want to get their business but it's got to be done early in the process. If you're already locked into the venue and you've already signed the contract and part of that contract is you will use the in-house AV company and you know then you have zero leverage. I mean it's just one of those things where you know uh, there's an old saying that you know before you sign the contract it's negotiation afterward it's begging. Um, so it's you know it's just one of those things that you know try and get that stuff taken care of as early in the process as possible and that's how you can get a lot of that wave so yeah there's there's a big markup but that's because a good chunk of it not they have to make their profit and then in addition to that they need to give you know a healthy uh, kickback to the hotel so that's again why it starts so high there you go uh, Melody says thank you yeah, not a dumb question at all not a silly question at all all right, we got a question here from Andrew. Uh, is there a certain decibel level that is acceptable before it reaches an uncomfortable level? Oh <laughs> boy, I'm, I'm there is, but oftentimes it's not about the decibels; it's about the frequency. So you know, it's it's not about the volume. Uh, you know, you think about like feedback or something like that, right? That's that can be needles in your brain or or scratches on a chalkboard, right? You know, it's not about the volume; it's about the frequency that comes. So, uh, I'm sure there. Are, I mean, obviously there are noise level limits that we talk about. Um, 
far as airplanes and things like that, where you can damage someone's hearing. So I think we need to be careful of that. And you'll usually see, you know, kind of the good sound folks. Um, also, it depends on how old they are. Like the like the old school audio guys would always walk around with a physical meter, you know, measuring the decibel levels. And I think I've got one somewhere. Um, and you don't see that as often. So I think there is a danger sometimes. And most of the time when I see that happening is uh, obviously music or, you know, things like that. But when things are overly loud in a room, it's because they're compensating for not having enough speakers uh, often where, again, or, or properly placed speakers where, again, we're talking about that middle area that's not getting covered in the stage. So they try and overcompensate with the volume uh, of the speakers rather than, you know, uh, you know, qu quantity over quality, we should say. Yeah, and that's, I think why that's why line array speakers sound so good, because line arrays are those kind of banana-shaped ones that go like this, and that's because they're pointing at the back of the audience, the next section, the next section, and that's why it's a line array, um, and it points down. So it, you wind up with this array that's hitting every single section of the audience, and that's why those sound so good at concerts and things like that, because it doesn't have to be as loud, because everybody's getting kind of the same signal pointed directly at them. And I think we've all been at events where there's been a speaker on a stand behind you and you're trying to have a conversation at a round and it's just blaring. And part of that is because that speaker right here behind your head is trying to hit the center of the room as well where there are no speakers. So that's also the difference between rigged, which means um, hanging speakers in the ceiling, or the ones uh, down down at the uh, on the ground on on stands. I mean, I've seen uh, older people, especially you know, let's say at a wedding, you know, for example, and they're taking the speakers on the stand and turning them back towards the wall because it's too loud for them. So those are definitely things to, uh, to do that. I mean, I could go on a rant about networking events that don't give you an opportunity to network, but that's a yeah. whole different that's a whole different webinar. Um, that I, I see that far too often where they go full on dance club, and you know what? Sometimes you want to just <laughs> have a conversation. Uh, with someone yep. that you met at the conference that day or something. Especially when they call it a networking event. <laughs> I always wind up in the smoking lounge because it's usually outside and quiet. And so yep. it's like, it's like I'm, not, I'm not out here to smoke. I just want to have a conversation. <laughs> All right, we got a couple more questions here. Uh, let's see. There was one more from Andrew. Uh, it's a good question about contracts. Uh, you know, if, equip uh, if equipment is damaged on a job due to usage, is the client responsible? Hmm, depends on the insurance and depends on, you know, I, I think there's also a level of, uh, again, honesty and transparency there where, you know, if it was the client's fault, you know, you would hope that their insurance will take care of it. You know, it's, um, and usually when you're straight up renting something, you know, then you're responsible for the damage that would be incurred on it. Uh, it gets a little messier when you start involving production companies and things like that where there's an extra layer of, of people and insurance and whose insurance covers what and... And who signed the contract. And who signed the contract and, and, and I've seen some very interesting insurance claims come through because of that, you know, those layers. And so um, there was an event, I wasn't on it, but I, I knew about it where uh, a line array tipped over and hit a very expensive car that was being used for, you know, decoration uh, in, in the room. And so, you know, who pays for it then? Is it the AV company who was, you know, cranking up the, the lift? Is it, you know, the production company who had hired the AV company? You know, is, you know so, uh, you know, is, or is it the person whose car it was? Because there was car insurance involved too. So, I mean, it was, it was a pretty messy situation to figure out where the, you know, where the "Quote unquote fault, like the legal fault, not the actual fault, um, and whose insurance company was going to pay for it." So, um, it's an That's important conversation to have. It's an important conversation to have uh, as far as whose insurance is covering what, uh, and and just to tie it back to AV, it's a very important if you're being asked uh, by a venue to use their vendors for anything. You know, so if it's a requirement from the venue uh, that you have to use the in-house rigging company or something along those lines, then you want to make sure that you're listed as an additional insured on their insurance. Because if they're making you do it, then it's, hey, it's your, your deal. <laughs> you know, so you know, make, sure that, uh, make sure that you're getting added as an additional insured on their insurance just in case something catastrophic did happen with the rigging, which obviously we would hope never would happen. And if I could just add one more thing, read your 
contracts. Yes. And not just the contract from the EV company, but read your policy, your insurance policies, because your insurance policies are very, very specific about what they will and will not cover. And if you're not sure, you need to ask the question as well. Make sure that you are reading those contracts because, uh, you know, it could have a little tiny little clause in there that says you're going to cover everything and you're going to come down and clean it up too. Uh, maybe not, but, <laughs> you know, read the contract to make sure it doesn't say that. All right, I think uh, we've uh, we got one more question here. Uh, it is now uh, is folks an hour in the webinar, so, so yeah, I think we we'll end it on this note here. So, Brant, thank you so much. Uh, with this one last question from Ingrid, is there a course not as elaborate, uh, shorter than five weeks than the technical meeting and event production certification? Um, I'll kind of answer that. Uh, one advantage, uh, at, and then you can <laughs> answer too, Brant. <laughs> um, one advantage of the uh, technical meeting and event production course too is that you can take it within the um, within the five week period but at your own pace as well so it's not that you need to be at a certain date and time every every single week so there is that nice advantage and you get to talk to Brant of course um, and then with the Event Leadership Institute too we do have some technical production videos uh, with our, our on-demand subscription library and that's $25 a month um, as well, uh, and if you become a subscriber for twenty-five dollars a month, you get twenty percent off of the technical meeting and event production course. Um, but Brand, do you have any other ideas as well? I mean, it's designed to be done in small, bite-sized chunks. So we actually designed it to be about two hours a week. Uh, you know, on the on the outside, I'd say, and so you really probably could slam through it in a day if you wanted to. Um, uh, and, and in fact, we have done some like one-day intensives for for some companies. But uh, it really is, is designed to be bite-sized. It sound, five weeks sounds kind of intimidating, but it's not really. It's, it's a couple hours a week. You can pick away at it during the week. I always tell people, you could do it during your lunch hours easily, um, you know, just doing 20 minutes a day. Uh, you could easily do it during your during your lunch hours. So, um, but event people are busy people, so I get it. Yeah, sometimes you want to just have that one quick, short, you know, sharp, get it done, and and that kind of thing too. So we hope that we tried to kind of go down the middle of it and 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 you know, kind of run that range. I'm waiting for someone to develop the USB stick. You just stick in your ear, and you've got the knowledge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, there you go. Well, Brent, thank you so much for all the great information today. Uh, of course, if you would like to uh, learn more or chat with Brent, let me just bring this back up here. Here are his, uh, Brent's contact information, of course, um, so you can meet or reach uh, out to him on Twitter, Facebook, and also send him an email if you'd like. And of course, uh, don't forget to uh, follow Event Leadership Institute and all our social, social networks. We're starting up on Instagram. I'd love to see more of you guys out there. Um, you can see me on, in a cowboy hat on Instagram, that's really important of course, uh, with education, I don't know. <laughs> So there you go. And of course, Brent's course is starting on September 19th. That's technical meeting and event production. Check that out at eventleadershipinstitute.com. And uh, I'll make sure to check out uh, more webinars and Facebook Live stuff that we're going to be trying to experiment with uh, with uh, Brent over the next little while. I guess we're committing him now. <laughs> yeah, follow, follow along. You know, Let us know what you like, what you don't like about this webinar. Like I said, I tried to keep it kind of high level and not get into the weeds, but maybe you want something a little bit more specific. You know, with the amount of time that we had, you know, we couldn't go into every single kind of light and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, but do you, or do you like the just the Q and A format? You know, I, I love, like I said, I love doing kind of live Q and A on the fly, uh, rather than a you know specific presentation where I just blah 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 for, for an hour. You know, let's talk, let's have that conversation, right? There we go. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I uh, hope you enjoyed the session. Please feel free to reach out with some feedback to both Brent and myself, and uh, we will see you at the next one. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.